Hello, Blaisdell Gospel Chapel and YouTube fans and subscribers alike. Um, I was asked by Andy Palmer from Blaisdell Gospel Chapel to uh, do a message on uh, Christmas, the beginning story of Christmas, uh, Matthew chapter 1 verses 18 through 25 is the portion that he asked me to cover. And so uh, we will get into it. Um, I'm going to read the portion of scripture and then uh, say a word of prayer and then uh, we get started. Matthew chapter 1 verses 18 starting. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not, to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Heavenly Father, just thank you for this time that... Uh, You've given me to be able to expound on your word, Lord, and I just pray that uh, hearts would be blessed this Christmas and through this message, Lord, and uh, I just pray that your your name would be glorified, and uh, thank you, Jesus, for coming to this earth, Lord, for the purpose of dying for my sins and the sins of the whole world, and uh we just thank you and ask these things in your name. Amen. So we'll start at verse 18. I'm going to kind of just go through uh, verse by verse and bring out some different some different thoughts. And um, we'll just go verse by verse till we get to the end. So <clears throat> in verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, which means this is how it happened. And this is where it happened. And um, these are the events that took place. When, as his mother Mary was espoused to, to Joseph, a uh, Hebrew espousal was uh, a certain amount of time that uh, before they were married, but it was pretty much considered a marriage. It was definitely a commitment. And it, uh, it was very serious and... It was the time right before that they were to be wed. So they were espoused, getting ready for the wedding, I'm sure. Maybe Joseph was building a house. Uh, maybe he was building some particular pieces of furniture. We don't really know, just some thoughts. Um, so they were getting ready. Um, but before they came together, in verse 18, before they had intimate relations, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, Matthew and Luke are the only accounts that have the Christmas story account, and chronologically, we don't exactly know when they found out that she was with child of the Holy Ghost. So, was it before she went to see Elizabeth? Was it three months later? I don't really know. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is now we have to think about Hebrew culture and the Hebrew law. She was found with child, which we know and she knew at this point that what was conceived in her was of the Holy Ghost. 
but what did her parents think? How did Joseph feel? I mean, obviously, in, in the human mind, there was infidelity. Um, so this was a very, a very bad thing for Mary. Um, very dangerous. I'm just going to give you a couple of verses that I found in the Old Testament that could have possibly related to this situation. And again, I don't know about all the chronolo the chronological order of how these events took place, so I'm not exactly sure how these verses would have applied, but uh, in Jewish, again, in Jewish time, Hebrew law, the culture, this was not a good thing for Mary. This was not a safe thing for her to be pregnant outside of the marriage. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10 says this, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And that would have been by stoning. Um, again, I don't know when they found out that she had conceived. I don't know if there were special laws that protected the, the, the woman from being stoned, if she had already conceived or not. I don't know that. I didn't get far enough to research all of that, but, uh, this is just some things that obviously were going through her mind, I'm sure, and also through Joseph's because they knew what the law said. But here's where I want to take a little bit different of uh, a turn and a little different insight. Um, again, I, I'm not trying to make this doctrinal at all. I'm not trying to say that this is exactly how it was. These are just some thoughts. Could it possibly have been that Mary was a Hebrew bond servant? Um, a bond servant wasn't exactly necessarily a bad thing. It was more of just a poverty type thing when somebody was in a debt or um, if they were just too poor to um, provide for themselves, they could uh, be bought as a Hebrew slave. And you can research this in, in uh, the Old Testament. Hebrew slaves were treated very well. They were given wages, they were given food and shelter, and they were taken care of. Um, I want you to go to Leviticus 19.20. We're going to look at this verse and then speculate a little bit. Again, I'm not exactly sure. And whosoever, Leviticus 19.20, lieth carnally with a woman that is a bondmaid, betrothed to an husband, sounds familiar, and not at all redeemed, bought, nor freedom given her, she shall be scourged. They shall not be put to death because she was not free. Is it possible that Mary wasn't stoned immediately because she was a bondservant and the punishment would have been a scourging instead of stoning? I don't exactly know. I have some scripture and Let's go to Luke's Gospel, Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. This, these verses help me to speculate a little bit more that it is possible that Mary might have been a bondmaid or a bondservant. Go to Luke, chapter 1. When Gabriel was talking to her, when she uh, uh, was talking with Gabriel, um, in verse 37 and verse 38, Gabriel said in verse 37, For with God nothing shall be impossible. And then she responded in verse 38, And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. The handmaid there in the Greek means female servant or female slave. Now, is it possible that she was saying that I'm the slave of the Lord or I'm just a servant of the Lord, like Paul said in his epistles? That's possible. But there is one more verse that really dr drives home to me that there is a possibility of her being a bondmaid. In verse 48 of Luke chapter 1, 
she says, For he, that is God, hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth shall all generations call me blessed. Low estate. You know, it's pretty much as low as you could get is being a bond servant or a bond maid. And um, again, she uses that word handmaiden and she actually refers to herself as having the lowest state of being a handmaiden. So just a little thought. Um, either way, either way, go back to Matthew chapter 1. Let's get into verse 19. It says, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately, not to make her a public example. Either way, whether she was a free woman and she would have deserved stoning, or if she was a bondservant and would have had a scourge, which wasn't a pleasant thing either, if you research the Hebrew scourge. Um, either way, he did not want her to go through pain. He did not want her to become a public example. Um, but he was also a just man, it said before that. A just person in the Greek means a person who's in accord with God's standards. So Joseph knew what the law said. He knew that there were problems. There might even been possible investigations going on during this time of um, them trying to figure out what was going on. Perhaps the elders of the, of the village were interrogating her, interrogating her parents, trying to find out what happened. And um, there was obviously this period of time from when they found out that she was with child till now when Joseph was thinking on these things. Um, but he was a just man. He wanted to be in accord with God's standards, but he loved Mary. He loved her, and he was not willing that she should go through any pain. And I was just reminded of Matthew chapter 5 in Jesus' early ministry on earth in the Beatitudes. He says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And I just, I love the mercy that Joseph had, this tender love toward toward Mary, even though at this point he could still assume that she had infidelity. And he still loved her that much that he didn't even want to get even with her. He didn't want her to go through pain. And uh, it's just a really neat intention that he had toward her. He was minded to put her away privately. Now, I don't exactly know what that means, um, but this is another reason why I like to speculate that she was possibly a bondservant, because the possible solution that he might have been able to take was, number one, he could have redeemed her, bought her from her master, and then married her, and then given her a bill of divorcement, according to Deuteronomy chapter 24. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 and 4. When a man taketh a wife and marrieth her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes. And, of course, at this point, he would, she would have lost his favor um, because he hath found some, in, some uncleanness in her. Then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And um, so it's possible that this is the course of action that Joseph may have wanted to take, that uh, he would have redeemed her and married her and then divorced her. So that way she could go away without being a public example, and then he could move on with his life. Again, speculation, just some possible things that you could research on your own time. Um, let's get on to verse 20. Verse 20 says, But while he thought on these things, 
And praise the Lord for that, because I was really struggling a lot with the first few verses, trying to figure out all that, the Hebrew law and the possible things that he could have been trying to, to uh, you know, put her away privately. And I was getting pretty puzzled. And, you know, then I read verse 20 while he thought on these things. So if Joseph was a Jewish man and he was puzzled, then I'm definitely going to be puzzled. So, um <laughs> So he was thinking about these things too, and, and, and I wrote this down. At any rate, this took a lot of heartbroken thought for Joseph. I mean, here we go. We just read about this guy. He was a just man. He was in accordance with God's will, but he wasn't willing to make her public examples. He still loved her. He still had tender intentions toward her, even though at this point he didn't exactly know that it was of the Holy Ghost, right? So he was thinking about this. He was tore up. Um, Behold, the angel of the Lord, and it means in the Greek, an angel. So we don't know if this was Gabriel or not. Um, it doesn't really matter. But the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So, <clears throat> this angel appears to him in a dream. He reminds him of his lineage, which is very important. Um, there is a verse, I believe it's in Psalms, it says, Judah is my lawgiver. Now, I thought the law came through Leviticus. Well, it did. But the new covenant is going to come through the line of Judah. And David was in the line of Judah. And Christ was in the line of Judah. And Christ ultimately is our lawgiver. He's our savior. He brought the new covenant in, right? So um, just remember that, that uh, it's very important that Joseph was the husband of Mary because if Joseph wasn't the husband of Mary, then the prophecy that Christ was going to come through the line of David, it wouldn't have been fulfilled. This is very, very critical point here that Joseph takes Mary as his wife. So this angel appears to him in a dream saying, Joseph, thou son of David, he reminds him of his royal line. Fear not to take unto thee, marry thy wife. I think it's interesting that he says, fear not to. And that's why I think that Joseph was considering taking her as his wife and then writing her a bill of divorcement. I could be wrong about that. But it is interesting because he says, fear not to do that. So maybe this was one of the solutions going through his mind. But at any rate, fear not to take unto thee, marry thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So now he knows the truth. He's been told the truth. And, and the neat thing is, is he says, fear not. He wants Joseph to move in faith, not in fear. The best part of this is, is that all of that struggle that I was having trying to figure out the law and, and how would have this lined up in the Jewish law and what courses of action should have been taken, it didn't matter because there was no sin. There was no infidelity. This was of the Holy Ghost. And the awesome thing about it is Christ came to fulfill the law. And because there was no sin, there was no sin involved, the law had no claim on Mary and Joseph's union. And that's why they didn't need to be afraid to become husband and wife, because they knew the truth. Even though I'm sure it took time for their neighbors and their parents and the elders of the community and of Nazareth to, to accept them. Um, but I do have one neat thought. This is a little side note. But go to, go to Luke 
chapter 2. My kids asked me the other day if, uh, maybe a week ago, if Jesus was, if there were any stories about when Jesus was a teenager, and I was like, well, there is one story about when he was around 12 years old, and I read that, um, and I just need to find it here. So, so Jesus at 12 years old, um, and his parents go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, but Jesus stays and Joseph and Mary unwittingly leave him in Jerusalem. And, um, listen to verse 44, and this is what's so cool about moving in faith is God can even remove the distrust and disdain of family members Listen to this. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. So years later, it sounds like there was some kind of reunion and that all of that disgrace and all of that trouble that they went through and all of that um, suspicion had been lifted. And that's what happens when we move in faith. And that's what happens when the law and sin has no claim on our life. So I, it was just a, an interesting thought that God can restore uh, down the road. I did have one more thought. Go to 1 Corinthians 15.56. This, the law had no claim on Mary and Joseph's union. 1 Corinthians 15.56 The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The law was being defeated at this very moment, at this very point in history, when Jesus Christ was conceived in Mary's womb. The law and the strength of sin was being defeated. It was beginning to be weakened because, remember, Christ is our new covenant. He's our new law. He's our lawgiver, right? My lawgiver is going to come from Judah, the line of David, the line of Judah. <clears throat> and you can read about that line lineage in um, Matthew chapter 1. And you'll find Judah in there, and you'll find David, you'll find Boaz, and ultimately you'll find Joseph at the end. It's all written so that way we might believe. So the strength of the law was being crumbled at this moment between this angel and Joseph and this angel basically pleading for Joseph to move in faith. Remember that Joseph was a just man, it says. Joseph was a just man. There's a Bible verse that says the just shall live by faith. Let's start at verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. She shall bring forth a son. This is the same thing that Gabriel told Mary in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 31. This is the calm confidence that Mary had, knowing and trusting that God was and would perform a work in her. Joseph was been told the same thing by this angel. She shall have a son. You know, this Christmas, Christ is offering you that same exact gift that he told Mary. She was trusting. She knew. She had a confidence that God would perform this work in her. It's interesting that God sent 
Jesus into Mary's womb, literally Christ inside of her. And then he wanted Joseph to take Mary as his wife. You know, a wife is a picture of the church. Jesus considers us his bride. And Jesus wants us to confess our sins, to believe in our hearts, that Christ has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, and that he, when we trust him, he sends his Holy Spirit to live inside of us. That's what the Bible says. It's what the Bible teaches. It's the same exact thing. Just like Jesus was conceived in Mary's womb, Christ wants to conceive salvation in your heart this Christmas, today. Today is the day of salvation. He's offering that same gift, Jesus Christ. He's the, he's the Christmas present that never fades. He's the Christmas present that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he wants to be that for you and for me. And then all we have to do is, uh, just like John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And if you go to Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, and verse 9, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him, what? Shall not be ashamed. Just like Joseph and Mary, they could hold their heads high. Why? Because it was of the Holy Spirit. It was not the strength of sin. It was not infidelity. It was not the strength of the law. It had no claim on them. And that's the same gift that Christ is offering you and me. He offers it to us. That we can trust him and he will live inside of us. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And we talked about how God took that, eventually took that shame away in their village a little bit, it sounds like. And there was some type of reconciliation because there they were with their family 12 years later, going to the temple, going to Jerusalem. And uh, the, the, the feast of the Passover was a celebratory, celebratory feast for families to enjoy together when you read it in the Old Testament. And so... <clears throat> Quite amazing, the parallels that you can draw from this story. Um, verse 21. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. He shall save his people from their sins. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. Jesus means Savior. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. He shall save. Romans chapter 1. I should have marked out all of my verses. <clears throat> for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Same thing we were just talking about. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Praise the Lord for that. But he shall save his people from their sins. Let's not forget that Christ was a Jewish man. He's God. Amen? 100% man, 100% God. But he was Jewish. And he came to save his people. And then we've been grafted in, the Greeks. So <clears throat> just, let's just remember that.
he shall save his people from their sins. But it's to this end that he was born, was that he would be born to die. And that through his death, because he died for our sins, that he could save his people and he could save us. In verse 22, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. We have this prophecy that's been fulfilled. When our Lord says he's going to do something, he will. This prophecy came from Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Isaiah 7. Let's look at our proof. Let all skepticism be removed. 714. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. That was written 742 years before this moment that we're reading about. 742 years. God is not slack concerning his promises. He will return one day. He talks about that in his word, and that's that's been prophesied, and it will happen. And I pray that anyone who listens to this message, that someday, if you're not saved, you will be saved, and you'll be ready to stand before God. Um, so, and, and uh, verse 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. But I thought that the angel just told Joseph to name him Jesus, which means Savior, and Emmanuel means God with us. But who's the they? When I was starting to study for this message, I was, I was praying, and I was asking God to give me insight, and then after I was done praying, I opened up my Bible, and my eyes fell on this verse immediately. This is during his crucifixion. Listen to this. In the book of Matthew, chapter 27. Interesting. Pilate set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Verse 38. Then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and the other on the left. What could be more of God with us than that? Right? What could be more of God with us? came to die. He is our king. He is the king of the Jews. And obviously this was written maybe with some type of sarcasm um, that Pilate wrote it, but it's still true. This was Jesus, the king of the Jews. So they shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, let that they be us this Christmas. Let's refer to him as Emmanuel. Talk to your children about him this Christmas. Make sure they know what Emmanuel means. And maybe maybe even when you pray to the Lord, you could talk to him and, and call him Emmanuel in your prayers this Christmas. And we can think of him as God with us. He's, he's not a God that hasn't been touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He's been tempted at every point as we have been, yet without sin. He became man. He bore our sins on the cross. And he's Emmanuel. He's with us. He's for us. On earth, peace, goodwill toward men, right? And that's what Christ did. That's what he brought us. Verse 24. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. He wasn't afraid. This, this, uh, this revelation from this angel gave him the answer that I think he was craving because it says he being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. I think Joseph was completely relieved because I think Joseph was really, really in love with Mary. And I think that this man just really loved his wife. 
and there was nothing that she could have done that would have changed his love for her as we kind of looked at in verse 19 as he wasn't willing to make her a public example and uh he got the one thing he truly wanted he got his bride and i think that's uh it's a it's a true true love story between mary and joseph and christ what he did for us and just what he did for these two and he fulfilled joseph's desire of his heart and he got his wife and i think that's what he really wanted ultimately and just praise the lord for for jesus and praise the lord for joseph because you know this was a pivotal very pivotal decision that joseph made because remember he was of the line of david this was prophecy that must and needed to be fulfilled and um verse 25 wrapping up and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son he didn't have any uh intimate relations with her until uh she brought forth jesus you know this guy just had so much respect and there's no skepticism allowed here from anyone that Jesus wasn't truly divine because Joseph made a point not to have any physical relations with Mary. There's no confusion. This was of the Holy Spirit. And someday I'm going to just, Lord willing, after I meet Jesus, I'd like to meet Joseph and I'd like to just shake his hand because this guy had a, a lot of respect for Christ. He had a lot of respect for Mary and he had a lot of respect for the whole world when you think about it because he was willing to take this step to make sure that there's no confusion. I like this last part. And he called his name Jesus. He called his name Savior. And he just did what he did what he was told to do all the way to the end and ultimately he got to name jesus uh his rightful name and uh, that's really neat uh so thank you for listening i hope this blesses your heart and merry christmas